Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, we'll hear from both the Senate and the House Republican leadership. We'll also introduce you to the newly elected state representative who's made U.S. history. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. Senate Majority Leader-elect Paul Gazelka recently announced committee chairmanships, including a new three-committee structure emphasizing health care. And in our last press conference, what we talked about was health care costs, health care access, and the, the need to reform the system that we have. And so as you see this committee structure, there is one area that has significant change, and I want to address that one. We created two strong Health and, Herman, health and Human Service Committees, not just one, but two, to reflect that top priority. And we're going to have to get used to this a little bit because uh, there are big uh, items in each one of those. But the first one is Health and Human Services Finance and Policy, and that will be chaired by Senator Michelle Benson. Uh, she has been our go-to leader on health care now for a number of years, and we felt that she best fit that position. Uh, she will be ready to react to what's happening in Washington, D.C., and to take Minnesota back to being the number one place that, you would, that provided health care for Minnesotans. But her committee is also going to handle a few other big public programs, uh, like medical assistance, Minnesota Care, I mentioned Minsure, and the Health Care Access Fund. The other big health care committee will be chaired by Senator Jim Abler, his committee is going to be called Human Services Reform, Finance, and Policy. And he's going to be tasked with finding savings in the HHS budget and reform. And how do we deliver services to the people of Minnesota the best way we can? And then one other area that we are also identifying in the healthcare area is a new policy committee on aging and long-term care. That's not a subcommittee, it's actually a, a policy committee that stands alone by itself, and that will be chaired by Senator Karen Housley. Uh, the House has a similar uh, um, committee, and so we want to align those, but, but that will be chaired by her. Uh, the focus is got on the growing challenges of an aging population. Uh, many of us have heard some of the, the key concerns of the age wave moving into Minnesota and across the country and how we handle the, the unique needs that are coming before us now. Preparations are underway for the 2017 legislative session. Last week, Senate Republicans announced a new committee structure and appointed chairmanships. To talk about this and other priorities for the next legislative session is the Senate Majority Leader-elect, Paul Gazelka. Welcome. Thank you. So in this new committee structure, there are three committees that are devoted to health care, including one on long-term aging. What do you hope this new structure will accomplish? You know, we did a lot of campaign, and many, many uh, legislators that are now legislators went door to door everywhere, and the number one issue was health care, but it wasn't always the same health care issue. One of them was, was men's share and the premiums. One of them was how we deliver health and human services care to people, mm -hmm. and aging was another one. What are we going to do with the aging population? And so we, that's a big committee that we made into three committees, each of them having direct responsibility, they can pass a bill there and it will go straight to the floor, but so that we can look at those three areas separately. So Michelle Benson is in charge of the portion that will deal with Minsure and medical assistance and maybe future Minnesota Care or MSHA, mm -hmm. but all of that related part. And then Senator Abler will be dealing with the health and human services issue, how we provide care from the government to people that need care. And then uh, we have another one will be for aging that we've got set up as well. But all three of them are important and, and that's why we divided it out into three. The um, new administration of President-elect Trump uh, has campaigned on uh, repealing the Affordable Care Act. In terms of how Minnesota deals with health care into the future, are you planning to oh, sort of a wait and see attitude to see what Congress does? 
or will you be moving forward with some of your own initiatives? Well, we're pretty convinced that they're going to defund it or repeal it in, in some form or the other in the first few months. I think we should expect that to happen. But even if they do, MNsure still exists. That runs separate from Obamacare because we set up the state exchange. And mm -hmm. so we have to start working on it. In fact, we are working on it right now. Uh, one of the things, for example, is related to the high risk, people that have high risk trying to get mm -hmm. health insurance. Most of them have been funneled into MNsure which means that's why those rates have been going up as much as 67 so, percent. In that 5 percent yes. so individual market. Yes, and so what we had before was MSHA, Minnesota Comprehensive Health Association. I think it had about 10 times as many people that it, it collected premiums from so that that was spread out much, much farther and more affordable for everyone. So there's lots of things we can do. It doesn't really matter whether they do it right away or not at the national level. We have to work right away here. Tax relief is a high priority for your caucus. It's a little early for any detail, but any tax relief that you're interested in, would it be directed towards small business, big business, individuals, or potentially rolling back Governor Dayton's tax increases? Well, first of all, we have to see if a special session happens and then includes the tax relief that we passed last year. 89% mm -hmm. of legislators, House and Senate, Democrat, Republican, packs, pa passed a tax relief bill. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's gonna happen there. If that doesn't happen, then ag property tax relief is really important. Uh, small business property tax relief is important. We gave credit for student loans on their tax form, so we gave some relief there. Mm -hmm. One of the things that did not happen, the House passed, the Senate did not, was income tax exemption for Social Security. And so that would be certainly another one that we want to look at. But, but we believe tax relief is important. Uh, four years ago, the other side raised taxes over $2 billion. We had a $2 billion surplus once we made it through the recession, so we think some of that should go back to the taxpayer. When looking at Minnesota as a business-friendly state, different organizations come in at different numbers. For example, uh, CNBC and Forbes rank Minnesota highly. Uh, the Tax Foundation gives the state a low ranking. What is your view of the business climate of Minnesota? Well, first of all, CNBC didn't ask the business owners. They just decided on the dynamics of what a, a state would be good for for businesses, uh, which I don't think was fair. If, if you ask NFIB, the, the small business group, or the chamber, the big business group, mm -hmm. both of them would say that we are not a very tax-friendly state. So the measurements we, we use, uh, I think it was either four or six years ago, we were ranked 43 worst. Now we're to 47, so there's not many places that are worse than what Minnesota is. And so I'd like to get down under 40. I mean, let's be, let's not be in the top 10 worst states for businesses. And the reason being is because they're the ones that create the jobs. Mm -hmm. If they're here, if they're successful, they pay well, they create more jobs, and everybody wins. If they lose or leave to another state, we lose. They're still functioning, but they're going to function somewhere else. And so that's why I want to be a business-friendly state, because in the end, it provides the jobs that everybody is looking for. Some journalists and longtime political observers anticipate that this session will be fairly contentious because of the divided government. At your press conference, you spoke of a desire to work across party lines, and you have a reputation for doing that. Are you committed to continue working in a, as much as possible a bipartisan way? Absolutely. I mean, there's some, we have to solve the health care crisis, and that, for that to be a win, the governor has to win and the House and Senate have to win, and that's Republican and Democrat. So that's a big one we have to get done. We have to pass a good long-term roads and bridges bill. And again, it has to be bipartisan. And so I've, you're right, I have earned a reputation of if where we can build bridges together, we should do it. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of areas that you are gonna be partisan. I know that I will be in certain situations, but on the things that are good for Minnesota that we should do that everybody benefits from, that should not be partisan. What motivated you to seek the Senate Majority Leader position? The short answer is my wife. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, it's just, it's funny because we thought, you know, we had had Senator Hand that he would be our Majority Leader and suddenly he loses early in the night and then we still win, we still take the majority. And so mm -hmm. my wife said, I, I really think you should run. And so uh, it was, She's a wise lady, so <laughs> you know. So I, I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. Mm -hmm. I just thought I, I think I have skills that could help our, our our Republican caucus, but also the state of Minnesota. And I've lived all over the state of Minnesota, so I thought 
this is a good opportunity and I should walk in it. Is there anything about the position that gives you cause though, or pause, not cause, pause? Well, you know, I don't know everything. I've never done it before. And mm -hmm. so, but that's why I intend to su surround myself with good leaders that are, you know, different. Where if you look at our leadership team, we're from all parts of the state. We're very different from each other. If you look at the chairs I've selected, most of them have experience in the area that they're going to be in. Mm -hmm. I'm going to surround myself with good leaders. Good leaders make the majority leader look good. That's a good way to put it. So, can Ed, before we go, uh, tell us something about yourself that might surprise Minnesotans. Well, down here I have a trademark of have a, a tie with a matching handkerchief. Yes, you so, do. So I dress up, but I really feel most comfortable in jeans and a pickup. Senate Majority Leader Elect, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. In the next session, legislators from rural districts will comprise more than 60% of the Republican majority in the House and the Senate. Joining me in the studio to talk about this and other House GOP priorities for the 2017 legislative session is Speaker Kurt Dowd. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. The Senate GOP has said that their priorities are health care, roads and bridges, and tax relief. What are the House GOP priorities? You know, I, th I think ours would probably be similar. I would say it's health care, health care, and health care. Um, you know, I think as we just came through this election, the, the number one issue obviously was uh, Minsure, the problems that folks are having with that, the effects of the Affordable Care Act. Um, I think it's incumbent on us to uh, work with the administration to find a solution to help those folks out. And um, we think that probably means uh, dismantling uh, our, our, our minsure here in Minnesota and, and moving people back to a, a, a more market-driven system like we had before, which was much more stable. Um, but uh, obviously we're going to have a good debate about that during the legislative session. Mm -hmm. That's our number one priority and it has to be. Uh, folks that are affected by that are really hurting. Um, beyond that, it's uh, job creation and economic growth. We want to focus on those things and, and you know, particularly, I know you're going to uh, want to talk a little bit about the, the, the metro-rural uh, divide, mm -hmm. but uh, particularly out in greater Minnesota, uh, we'd like to focus on what we can do to make Minnesota more competitive to grow jobs out in uh, greater Minnesota. Um, also, uh, you know, I think um, we want to work on, on some tax relief. I think we're going to have to wait and see a little bit what happens with uh, the forecast, both uh, the December forecast and the, the February mm -hmm. forecast. Mm -hmm. And once we see those, we'll know a little bit more. Okay, and as you mentioned, there, a lot has been made from this election of the a national debate between the rural and the metro areas. And you do have a majority of rural representatives. So what what specifically do you have in mind for that group of people? Well, two, two years ago when we took the majority in the Minnesota House, uh, we felt that Democrats prior to that, and that was, th th when we took control two years ago, it put an end to complete Democrat control for, for a two-year period. Mm -hmm. So uh, we felt that Democrats had kind of, kind of left Greater Minnesota behind. Um, when I talk to folks out in Greater Minnesota, we, we know that they don't feel like they've fully recovered from the from the recession and that the economic recovery has not been uh, as robust as it has been in the metro area. And I'm not sure that folks in the metro area are even fully feeling like they're back to where they were prior to the recession, uh, but, it's, but it's much worse in greater Minnesota. So we want to focus on those things. We want to figure out why uh, we're not starting new businesses uh, out in greater Minnesota, which would create new jobs, why Minnesota businesses are expanding in other states instead of expanding here in Minnesota. Um, those, those are simple things that, that I think we can probably take a look at, um, which will help. Obviously, that's going to take some time um, to get that sort of economic growth, but we need to make Minnesota more competitive uh, for those kinds of jobs. And, and when the economy is growing and we're creating more jobs, that it, it creates a, a draw for people uh, that, that can move up into, into better paying jobs and better paying job opportunities. And frankly, that helps everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, a big goal for us with Greater Minnesota. And so what about the metro area? I mean, your job as speaker is to balance the interests of the entire state. So what are your metro and suburban representatives sure. looking for? Well, and, and, and we're excited. I think when we took the majority two years ago, we won 11 seats at that time. Ten of those 11 were in greater Minnesota, and folks said, oh, this is going to be the Republican, you know, greater Minnesota majority. And, mm -hmm. and at the time, we said, we want to focus on all of Minnesota, because we felt like greater Minnesota got left behind, but we also don't want to forget about the metro area. Uh, we think there's a lot of things that, that, that we can do. We're excited that we won 
four seats this time in, in the metro area, and, and we showed that we're not just a party of Greater Minnesota, we're a party that's, uh, that's statewide. And, and uh, you know, the transportation issue uh, that's going to be important again during this, the legislative session affects both the metro area and Greater right. Minnesota. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Democrats pushed transit really hard in the metro area. Uh, we feel that uh, there's a, a big need to put money into roads and bridges first before we do the transit. And the transit, if we do it, needs to make sense. It needs to really demonstrate that it's going to reduce traffic on the roads or, or, or be in the right place that's going to move people effectively and efficiently. And um, we have some real concerns about the Southwest Light Rail. I'm sure we're going to talk about that during the session. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to focus on things that will be good for all of Minnesota, uh, things like roads and bridges. As you know, in the last legislative session, our governor is, is a Democrat and the Senate was democratically controlled. Mm -hmm. And now that has changed. The House, will, or the, I'm sorry, the Senate will have a Republican majority, yeah. but a slim majority. So how is that going to work? Well, we've actually grown our majority in the House, uh, which is a, a comfortable thing for us. We picked up an, a net pickup of, of four seats. Uh, there's still one open seat um, that, that will be filled in a February special election, which is in a fairly Republican district. So we feel confident we uh, should be able to win that. If we do, we'll have 77 uh, members. 68 is the majority, so that gives us a comfortable margin. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to be good in that we won't have, and, and Senator Bach is a good friend of mine, but uh, he is uh, a little old-fashioned in his politics, and, and you know he sometimes will wait you out until the very end of session, hoping that that will uh, move you off of your position or move you towards his position. Well, that didn't always work with me and and uh, it wasn't an effective way and I don't think it served Minnesotans well. So my hope is by having a Republican House and a Republican Senate, we can get our work done earlier, we can agree uh, earlier and get some bills on the governor's desk in time to have a, a debate, a full debate uh, in, in, in public so people can participate in that. The speculation, though, is that it might be contentious. What do you think? Well, you know, it, it, it certainly could be. Um, the interesting mechanic of what's going to happen in the Senate is with just a one-seat majority, they're going to need every, if, if they pass things that are that are not bipartisan, they're going to need every member of their caucus to vote for every bill every mm -hmm. time, which um, almost never happens in right. St. Paul, regardless of who's in control. So um, most, and I think that's maybe what people don't always understand about what we do. Most of what we do is bipartisan. Mm -hmm. uh, the media, of course, always likes to report when we disagree or when we when we fight because that makes for a better story but most of what we do is bipartisan and I think this will actually uh, probably be a catalyst to us wanting our bills to be very bipartisan so hopefully it'll give us a good consensus legislation um, that that also the governor can agree with one thing that I want to make sure that the administration understands is I've had a frustration that the governor doesn't always fully participate in the legislative session mm -hmm. and sometimes doesn't get involved until the last couple of weeks um, we want we want to make sure that his commissioners are uh, authorized to, to participate and negotiate in the hearings we want decisions to be made during our public hearings in, in the committee process um, and we want his commissioners and the administration to be involved in that process so we can have it happen in, a, in an open transparent place and um, so we want them to be engaged from the very beginning of session and, and participate fully uh, through the committee process as well. So you've completed your first term as speaker you're about to start your <laughs> second term as speaker yep. what lessons have you learned? Well, um, it, it's interesting. I think, uh, actually, I, looking back, I, I don't feel like I did a, 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 a too bad a job. I think it was a pretty successful uh, first couple of years, and I think that's why we probably not only retained the majority, but picked up some seats in a year, a presidential year, mm -hmm. when I think folks would have expected we would lose seats and maybe even lose the majority. Um, so I think that, that speaks well of the way I have tried to connect with people and talk with people. Um, you know, I think we probably can do a better job getting work done earlier in the session, and that's why I want to engage the governor mm -hmm. earlier in the session and make sure that people understand that, that I think and, and we all think that that serves Minnesotans better if we can do our work uh, in the committee process, in public, in a transparent place, and have the, the administration fully actively participating there. Um, so I think I want to move things up and, and try to make sure that we're not cramming things into the end of session. Mm -hmm. It just, I think it's become such a, a, a natural thing around here that things get jammed into almost the end of session. Almost an expectation, it, really. It, it really yeah. almost is. And I, yeah. I, I, I agree with everybody that says that we can do better, um, and we can do better. So it's going to be a big priority of mine uh, to do that. Now, I still think we did a pretty good job over the last couple of years, and I think the voters agreed with us. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I think uh, we owe it to them to, to really be responsible and, and work with the governor. We obviously still have divided government, so right. we have to work with the governor uh, to accomplish a budget this year and, and, and next year, uh, hopefully a bonding bill. And, and I look forward to a, a successful uh, next two years. Speaker Dodd, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Minnesota made the history books in the 2016 election, electing America's first Somali-American legislator. Representative-elect Ilhan Omar joins me now in the studio to talk about her historic election to the Minnesota House of Representatives. Welcome. Thank you so much, Anne, for having me. So when did you come to the United States? How did you come to be here? Yeah, um, so uh, I, I come from uh, Somalia, East Africa, and uh, my family after the war, um, they fled to neighboring country, Kenya, and we were in the refugee camp there for about four years. And in 1995, we got sponsorship um, to come to the United States. I started out uh, in the East Coast, okay. um, and that's where I went to middle school. And uh, I didn't really speak English, we only knew two words, and those were like, hello and shut up. <laughs> um, and as you could imagine, it, it, it was a transition and mm -hmm. um, faced some challenges and barriers. Um, but we ultimately decided to move to Minnesota a um, few years later, um, the start of my freshman year of high school, mm -hmm. uh, because my father believed that uh, Minnesota would offer an opportunity for a great education and economic stability. So my whole family relocated here. And how did you get involved in politics? My um, father and, and grandfather were born during colonial times in Somalia and had always uh, been excited about uh, the ideas of uh, democracy and never really got to fully participate in a free democracy where they could vote in elections. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we moved here um, and, and established uh, ourselves in Minnesota, my grandfather wanted to take that opportunity to get involved. And so I took him um, to our first caucus gathering uh, mm -hmm. to participate in that grassroots um, uh, participation level. And for me, that was uh, the beginning of uh, my political involvement and political career. And so, in order to become the DFL nominee, you defeated longtime incumbent Representative Phyllis Kahn in the primary. What about your message as a newcomer do you think resonated with the voters? Yeah, um, well, one, I, I want to say I, I greatly honor the, the legacy Representative Kahn um, has had in our state and the one that she leaves. Um, it is uh, an honor to follow in her footsteps. Our district likes to make history, mm -hmm. uh, and so this is another um, tick in, in that history uh, pile. Um, I think we had a message of unifying our district. We live in one of the most diverse districts in, in the state, if not in the nation, mm -hmm. um, and we, had to, we knew we had to build a, a coalition, a winning coalition of students, East Africans, and longtime residents. Uh, who believes in a vision of uh, being a progressively bold uh, mm -hmm. in, in advocating for uh, issues around uh, affordable and accessible higher ed, mm -hmm. um, in, in closing the opportunity gap uh, in, in education and, and advocating for wraparound services, uh, in, 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 being, um, in, in fighting for environmental justice and uh, uh, divesting from fossil fuels. Uh, and, and the one um, issue that was dear to my heart, which is criminal justice reform. And so that, that message of taking action uh, in, in the true sense of what it means to be progressive uh, mm -hmm. really resonated um, with, with the district. And, um, and, and that's how we were able to um, not only um, defeat a 44-year incumbent uh, and another opponent, but also um, increase voter turnout by 37%. Um, and in the general election, uh, win with 4,000 more votes than anyone has historically gotten in our district. So you've talked about a lot of the issues that you're passionate about. What do you hope to accomplish in the House? I mean, do you, what, what kinds of, will you be putting forward some legislation along those lines? What do you hope to get done? Yeah, I know there's a lot of people that um, are, are not feeling optimistic um, being in, in a minority, mm -hmm. but I'm really excited 
to have a conversation with my colleagues um, on, on the other side of the aisle about what what is it that we got elected to do is to work on behalf of the people of Minnesota. So I'm excited to tackle our disparities uh, when you know our economic disparities in closing that opportunity mm -hmm. gap in in furthering our allocation of resources um, so that every child in Minnesota has the opportunity. Um, to get uh, the great education that my father thought I could receive here, which is what I got, and uh, that has given me the opportunities that I have today. Um, and, and making sure that um, people in, in my district and uh, across the state who have that entrepreneurial spirit that's, um, uh, that's driving them have the resources that they need to uh, open small businesses and um, and to continue to build uh, their small businesses and and making sure that we are reforming criminal justice um, in in our state and that we uh, understand that it costs us more money um, to send people away um, and and uh, then it would cost us for us to rehabilitate them and look at restorative justice measures that brings them back into the society um, uh, re reformed and um, and as full citizens mm -hmm. to, to partake in rebuilding the communities that, um, that they live in. So I want to touch just briefly on some recent events. When President-elect Donald Trump was here in Minneapolis, he pointed to the stabbing uh, by the Somali American at the St. Cloud Mall. And then this week we had another incident at Ohio State University. So there is a lot of concern about these young Somali men and their susceptibility to a message of extremism. What is your perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's disheartening to, to, um, to see what has taken place and, and uh, my condolences um, uh, to the families that are affected um, by these incidents. But I, I, I want to make sure that people understand that it isn't uh, these particular young people that are receptive um, to to a message of divisiveness and hate um, and violence. It it it, it is uh, something that is happening um, uh, along uh, along uh, racial, um, cultural, and religious um, lines. That is, it's not only for a particular group that is susceptible to certain um, violence, mm -hmm. uh, that it is something that could happen in, in all communities and that we need to collectively think about what it means for us to um, have a conversation about how do we uh, protect our, our youth, how do we uplift them and make mm -hmm. sure that they have uh, another outlet to, to, to voice their frustrations. How can we as a society rise up and show up for the young people who are feeling disenfranchised and disconnected mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the communities they belong to. Um, and, and how could we assure um, that we are sending a, a message of love and not one of hate and violence? Representative-elect Omar, congratulations on your historic election. I want to thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been a wonderful opportunity, and I'm grateful to, to have this outlet to, to speak to the people. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.